Hello? I will read it. Future, I'm watching some the stuff he's doing, stuff's the IRC channel, so you can put stuff on there. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll read the mail. I'd rather have the echo than break that again. Five, nine, one, two, So let's have Pogo draw the Pogo winner. It takes more than 20 terabyte to get into Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> One does not simply DMA into Mordor. In the back. <laughs> Jeremy Rowe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You've got much to lose. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't see behind me. All right. You guys go do the needles. Uh, so I'll I'll be really quick and save the full remarks uh, for closing remarks. But if you want a T-shirt, we will sell you some. We, the number of people wanting a T-shirt this year crushed us. We're going to do a second run and mail them to people. Uh, so I'll, After I'll be really quick and save send our order. Months, the uh, orders get flooded again. So we, 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 we quickly ran out. If you still want a t-shirt, come and see us at registration. We'll figure something out, but it'll almost certainly be mailed to you. Um, beyond that, uh, I don't want to delay too much longer. Susan Sun's talk tomorrow is against this talk. I imagine as soon as we're
we're done talking, she'll head over there and begin. Um, but since we're running a little bit late, without further ado, uh, I appreciate him for being willing to do this remotely. Uh, he's right. Remote talks suck. I can confirm that now. Um, but thanks for being a good sport. Without further ado, ESR. Without further ado, I appreciate him for being willing to do this remotely. He's right. Remote talks suck. I can confirm that now. Um, but thanks for being a good sport. Without further ado, ESR. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Wow, that is some awful, awful lag. All right, it feels like I'm talking to Mars. That's, it's really bad having to wait three seconds for my laugh lines to take effect. All right, so... Okay. Camera just got knocked again. I'm looking at the ceiling. Well, that was three seconds ago. Wow. Just hope you never have to give a speech with a three-second lag. All right. Well, 21 years ago, I wrote the original Cathedral and the Bizarre Manifesto. And the first thing I want to point out is we've won an awful lot of victories since then. The most widely deployed operating system in the world is open source. Okay, so it runs on smartphones instead of PCs, but it's still victory. I'm not hearing any sound. I am still not hearing any sound. Uh, I am not sure this is working. Um, I'm guilty of that ESR. I muted you to get rid of the echo effect. Uh, I'm not sure this is working. Okay. Three, yeah, well. Two, uh, um, and now you know what the three second echo is like. Wow. Now these are, this is absolutely the most difficult set of conditions I've ever given a talk under. Not excluding the time I did it on a boat in the middle of the Baltic Sea. Um, all right, well, let me start over again. Um, we've won a lot of victories in the last 21 years. But one of the things about engineering is when you solve a set of problems, your reward is you get to deal with the problems that come with your solutions. And I am sitting before you as an exemplar of one of the problems that come with our solutions. Now that the world is dependent on internet infrastructure and on open source software, the software that you guys write and that I write, there are certain problems that come with that dependence. And one of them is a phenomenon I'm going to label the load bearing internet person. Now we'll wait for the audio to catch up. Um, I think I'd rather deal with the echo. Hello? Camera is moving again. I have you unmuted again. All right, very good. Um, Hello? Camera is moving again. Okay. Wow. I'm still talking to Mars. Uh, okay. 
Wow, I'm still talking tomorrow. <laughs> Resuming. So we have a set of problems today that have to do with the, the solutions that we've come up with over the last 20 years. And that is that we now have load-bearing internet people. We have people that the internet depends on to maintain critical infrastructure software. Oh, good. Okay, the lag's down to about a second now. <clears throat> I am a load-bearing internet person. There are several others I could name. These are people who are maintaining critical bits of infrastructure and things like uh, DNS, time service, um, the application that passes location information from the GPS sensor on your phone to the maps and other location-aware applications in it. These are things, these pieces of infrastructure are things that have in common the problem that it's difficult to monetize them. That means there's no revenue stream, there's no profit motive, and there's no money going to the people who are maintaining the software, which is fine as long as we're all young and invincible and in perfect health and don't need to eat much. If any of those preconditions stop being the case, we have a problem. And a lot of the load-bearing internet people nowadays are starting to get into their 50s and 60s. This brings up two problems. One is, how do we plan for succession? What happens when the load have to, has to pass? And the other question is, um, what, are we, what are we gonna do with our old workhorses? Send them to the glue factory? Um, well, I don't have a solution to all of these problems today, but there's one that we've got to solve if we want our internet to keep working, and that is that the people who work on this, these commons pieces of infrastructure, time service, DNS, and so forth, somehow they got to get money to pay bills or there's going to be breakage. Uh, in fact, arguably, we've already had some cases of this. We had shell shock and a bunch of other uh, security bugs that were due to the fact that those projects were being done by volunteers who were chronically underfunded. Um, I've been actually worrying about this problem for quite a while, um, and I made a stab at solving it institutionally by trying to found the uh, uh, the Internet Civil Engineering in, uh, Institute, but that shut down last month. It turns out that um, Recruiting people who are able and competent to run an organization like that is not so easy. Uh, so now we need to try something different. And I've been noodling on the problem, and I think I know what it is. I want to propose that we need a new custom. Uh, and the custom is this. Um, some of you might remember an old religious practice called tithing where you took a small portion of your income and you sent it to worthy causes. And historically, you did it through a church, but we don't need to do that anymore. We've got things like Patreon and Subscribestore. So let's let the audio catch up. Wow. I don't even know if anybody's heard what I'm saying. This is pretty awful. Um, Yes? Oh, I can actually see the laughing. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, so no audience sound. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You know, there's a reason I gave up being Mr. Famous Guy back in 2004. Uh, all right. Well, that sounds like a good idea. All right, so speaking of infrastructure lash-ups, yeah, like this. Um, okay, so uh, centralized ways of solving that problem have been tried, and, well, I tried it, but failed. So I'm going to propose a decentralized one. It's a custom we all need to op adopt if we want to have a healthy Internet. If you have a regular job and you have an income and you have an employer, Here's what you need to be doing. 
look around you and find load-bearing internet people. People like, oh, here's a good example that's not me. How many of you know who, you know who Dave Tott is? I'm sorry, I guess you can't answer that because I can't hear you. Uh, Dave Tott is a friend of mine who has done massive service to the net in the form of fixing the buffer bloat problem. Some of you all probably know about the buffer bloat problem. Uh, it's the reason um, the internet video used to suck much worse than it did, uh, than it does now, I mean. Um, more recently, he's fixed some massive latency problems in Wi-Fi, and right now he's fighting to keep um, uh, routers from getting screwed up by a priority scheme that is, well, let's just say biased in some interesting ways. This is a guy who has given more than a decade to uh, trying to keep the internet in good shape. And not only has it been a, a mostly thankless job where he's tried to, tried to scrabble for pennies while people were making literally hundreds of millions of dollars on the results of the work that he did, it, it's, it's broken his health. He's blind in one eye and has, has chronic health problems that I think come from the fact that he spent years um, living like a nomad, hand to mouth. Um, uh, it, it, it really made me sad to watch. And in fact, um, watching Dave Tott's experience of burning himself out like that was the reason I tried to found ICEI. Um, another example is a man named Harlan Sten, who's the maintainer of, um, of NTP Classic, the, the uh, the time synchronization software that my project NTP Sec forks from. Um, he his well, the details are kind of embarrassing, but his health got broken too. He's I he spent oh 15, 20 years out in the wilderness uh, keeping time synchronization working, and he could barely get anybody to put to 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 put a thin dime into supporting the work, and yet this is something. Credit card systems, bank transfer systems, uh, time-sensitive crypto, they all depend on accurate time synchronization. synchronization. And yet there was never any connection from that but to, back to, hey, you know, if the guy actually working on this didn't have to scramble for grants constantly and didn't have to worry about where his, his next meal was coming from, maybe we might have a few more hours in this software and a few fewer critical security bugs. So this is a serious problem. Load-bearing internet, internet people, when they collapse, can take critical services down with them. And we, the more dependent we get on internet services, the worse a prospect that gets. So to hedge against that, those of you who understand the problem, and, and if you have a, a respectable income, look around you. Find a load-bearing internet person. It doesn't have to be me. Uh, Find a load-bearing internet person and then dedicate $30 a month, the price of a decent restaurant meal, um, and, and, and send a remittance through uh, PayPal or Subscribestar or any other way to do that. And the thing, I, I, after I thought of this, there's a risk in a system like this that all of the attention and the money will go to a few highly visible people like, for example, me. Um, but I don't actually want that to happen. There's a, there are a lot of people who are working on infrastructure in much more obscurity than me, and they deserve support too. So what we need is fan out. Instead of setting $30 to one person, try to identify three uh, load-bearing Internet people and send 10 bucks to each of them, 10 bucks a month. Not much to pay to save your civilization. Uh so um, that's what I hope you'll do. And um, more than that, please spread the word. There's a problem. We all have to join in solving it. And the more we distribute the load, the better this will work. So um, that comes to the, that gets to the end of my rant about infrastructure. I, I, I guess I could talk about happy things now. Um, this is, Normally is the point in my talk at which I would invite interaction with the audience and find out what you want me to talk about, but that's a little difficult under these circumstances because I can't hear you.
Wow, looks like I've put everybody to sleep already. Um, is this working? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I tried that. <laughs> yeah, I tried that. I found an organization called the Internet Civil Engineering Institute. I tried. I can't hear him anymore. So the answer is, I tried that. Uh, I tried uh, launching Internet Civil Engineering Institute. I tried for seven years to make that work, and I could not. It turns out uh, finding people with the competence and the bandwidth to run an organization like that is really hard. So instead of trying to cent centralize it, in the best tradition of Internet engineering, we make it robust by decentralizing it, distributing the load. All of you... Do your own, uh, do just a little bit of due diligence. Look around you, figure out what needs support. Because so many of you have different viewpoints and different ideas about what's important. That means the funding will go to a large enough spread that'll be useful. Next question. I do not know what that hand gesture means. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Well, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to answer that question, but I'm going to do it visually. Oh, great. So, like, I was going to, oh, wait. Uh, so, you can't actually see. Uh... <laughs> Does that look fake to you? Yeah. I think all of you should be doing that to every freaking company you work for.
Well, um, once it becomes known that people are, well, okay, I know how to solve this problem. Watch my blog. I will blog about the people who are in trouble and need support. Eventually, there won't be only one channel. Other people will be advertising, hey, this project over here needs some support. I, I could name half a dozen. Um, um, Lead, for example, um, the, the open source firmware stack for routers, um, they desperately need to be able to support, uh, support a full-time uh, release engineer and integration guy. Uh, there's lots of worthy work out there. But you wanted you wanted you wanted a tip on how to find the the the, pro, the projects and the load bearing internet people who need support. I'll get the ball rolling. Watch my blog. Uh, and well, in the meantime, I could use some more money. <laughs> uh, uh, medical bills, man. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, there is no such thing as minor surgery on the financial level. Let me put it that way. Hi, Eric. Are you familiar with the website Act Blue and their model? No. Okay. I imagine the institute was more of like a major nonprofit approach to like board of directors and, and try and build infrastructure and all of that. Yeah, like what I tried to do. Whereas Act Blue was something set up by some Democrats to let rank and file donors give money to whatever candidate they wanted to it was like one website where if you want to donate to a nevada assemblywoman and you know a connecticut house member and you know a senator in your, in your state you could pick them all from this website and make donations to each of them individually so it was one clearinghouse so rather than build an institute do you think that would be a model that might work in this case where Act Blue as a website, I believe, takes like one percent or two percent of the donations just for operating costs, and all the money goes to the candidates. You could build a central platform that lists all of these people, all these pillars of the community, and then that would connect the rank and file donors and companies to these people. Um, let me tell you why I'm a little suspicious of approaches like that. They're subject to political capture, uh, which is which is why I will on my blog I will advertise load bearing internet people and and projects that can use your support that can use your remittances, but I do not want to be the only authority on this. I do not want to be the only person doing that advertising and that due diligence because that's too much concentration of power for anybody. Um, uh, I know, I know you were talking about decentralization, and that certainly sounds like a good goal. Um, but I, I currently contribute to the Free Software Foundation and the Software Freedom Conservancy. Yeah. Do you think organizations like that can play a an increased role in, in solving this problem? Frankly, no. They have other concerns. They have enough to do keeping their litigation shops running. Additional questions. These are all good questions, by the way. Yes, a question from someone who certainly didn't ask a question earlier about Evil Overlord. So how do we keep this from the inevitable case where someone who is not a load-bearing uh, person claims to be and then poisons the well for everyone because they've shown that they can't be trusted? Well, I mean, they don't poison the well for everyone. Some people will get taken in and send a remittance, and they'll lose a few bucks a, a month. But that doesn't mean the whole system will collapse. There will be some waste. There will be some people running scams. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Additional questions. I do believe for now you have depleted the question pool. <laughs> Very good then. Uh, should I sign off or is there something else we ought to do? Well, now that everything is 
in its own really bodged way working smoothly. If there's anything you were touching on early on during Echo Fest that you would like to reiterate more clearly, we can certainly do that. Okay, let me gather my thoughts for a moment here. Um, thought gathering, thought gathering. By the way, that the person with those two questions is Ian Brune. He's my apprentice. He's doing good work. Treat him well. Uh, let's see. Um, victories. Yes, we have won many victories. Let us exit on a high note, noting that these, what I'm talking about is a problem of success. And, and the problems of success are much better to have to deal with than the problems of failure. Uh, what else can I say? Um, I'm sorry, gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I'm not really at my best. Uh, uh, I have someone with a question. One sec. Yeah. So for um, those that uh, um, on the other side of the uh, coin, um, you were talking about a, an apprentice here, which sounds like a great idea. Um, it, is there a way to encourage those that are load-bearing internet people to reproduce themselves into not just one, but multiple additional people to take their place upon their need to retire? That is a very good question. And it, it's one that um, you kind of opened up the conversation now, and that's good. Um, I have been trying to address that for years. Um, back around 1996, you, you all might remember that I wrote this document called How to Become a Hacker. Uh, and I've done similar things since. Uh, and the reason is that we have too large a culture for one-on-one -on -one individual instruction to scale really well. It's good when that can be arranged, but um, we need to build a, a, a corpus of, of artifacts and documents and, and stuff that people can immerse themselves in, even in the absence of mentors. Um, and I think that's the most effective way to, to, to do what you're talking about. People are going to have to train successors, yes, but before that will work, we have to develop a larger pool of people who want to be successors. So again, that means a little cultural engineering. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this. Um, we have two problems and they meet in the middle. One is that people aren't doing enough formal mentoring. And the other is we need to be better at, at, at um, making our culture infectious. So people want to join it and take on these roles. Um, I, I, I don't have complete solutions to any of this, but, I hope I'm, I'm showing a direction that we need to push in. Additional questions? Yes, one sec. Hey there. I uh, don't necessarily have a question, but I wanted to say that I hadn't thought about your problem, the problem that you said earlier, but I did, I keep hearing about like uh, smaller open source things like for instance, the Mongo and AWS issue. Um, and I find it interesting that now, now we're talking about individuals too, but this, kind of, this problem kind of seems systemic a little bit. It is systemic, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm focusing more on support for individuals is because open source projects tend to be, well, structurally weak. They don't have formal organizations. They're not legal entities. They don't even tend to have bank accounts. Uh, and what that means is that if you're going to have to pass, if you're going to uh, su pass support to a project, you almost always have to do it through individuals. And uh, once I got there, I realized that we have the infrastructure for doing that. Patreon and Subscribestar exist. Those are the tools we need to learn to use in a systematic way. Um, and I, I'm grateful for the person who pointed out that there's a discovery problem. You might want to spend your $30, $30 a month and not know who to spend it on. So uh, once I get off the, uh, uh, once I get out of this conference, I'm going to sit down and start making a list of names. And then I'm going to uh, put out a blog post. And um, hopefully that will start all of you uh, uh, to get pointed in the right direction. All right, another question, Mr. Rundle. Oh, I will also say, by the way, that I have a threshold amount in my mind above which uh, if my Patreon feed gets larger than that, I'm going to say, 
okay, stop, stop, stop. Other people get more need to get more money now. I have enough. Uh, so, so what was the other question? Mr. Raymond, since you released the Halloween paper since that time, what is your current estimation of Microsoft vis-a-vis -vis the open source movement? I think Microsoft is internally very, very conflicted. On the one hand, they have some people with real vision there who realize that uh, this is that open source is is not just the present but the future, and that they have to get along with it. Um, there are persistent, persistent rumors that um, there's a group inside Microsoft that's actually trying to re-engineer Windows to be a layer on top of an open source kernel. I don't know how many of you have heard those rumors, but the thing is, given some of the thing, other things I've heard coming out of Microsoft, those rumors are actually credible. Those, there are people inside Microsoft who know that we won the engineering war, and they're trying to act on that. Uh, on the other hand, they've got a lot of people inside that organization who are still in the old, we must destroy all competition mindset, and still in a very closed, proprietary-centered world. And I don't think we can say at this point that Microsoft is one thing in this respect. There are factions. There are people pulling in different directions. And honestly, from the outside, I'm not sure that there's much any of us can do to influence that. Okay, another question that uh, was handed to me. How do we guard against corporations taking over our grassroots decentralized funding efforts for these load-bearing people and gaining more control and influence to the detriment of the projects and the internet. Same for corporations picking the replacements. So, okay, so uh, how are they gonna take over this decentralized funding effort? By sending developers more money? That doesn't sound like a problem to me. <laughs> um, one thing you can do is co-opt these people. On, on my Patreon page, I have two named tiers. One is uh, uh, twenty dollars a month, and one is a hundred dollars a month. The hundred dollars a month is labeled institutional supporter, uh, and I think other load-bearing internet people ought to have the distinction too. I encourage. I have three institutional supporters at the moment. If you work for a corporation that understands what's going on and wants to be serious about giving support, don't you give me money? Tell your corporation send that hundred dollar remittance and then oh boy you get the you get a link to your web page put in the credits page of all my projects uh, we don't have to worry about those people co-opting us we can co-opt them um to touch to clarify on that earlier question i think it was a concern of maybe uh, a corporation hiring away someone and kind of you know, taking over control of their revenue stream that way and then dismissing them and continuing for their own nefarious purposes. Well, how can they do that? The revenue stream is attached to the person, not, not the, 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 the project. Uh, I believe if, maybe is a hypothetical condition of employment, something, something along those lines, and you know, enticement, that kind of thing. So, I mean, there are certain kinds of evil that you can't hedge against. Um, you just have to notice that they've happened after the fact and bail out. Uh, I mean, I, there's there's not much we can do to prevent that kind of thing in advance. We can only notice when it's happened and raise a shitstorm about it. One more question. One sec. Is there any other forum or way that we can keep this conversation going after this besides looking at your blog? Um, I will think about that, and I will... Um, I will post my thoughts on my blog. Yeah, maybe we can. What was that? Well, I mean, that's the channel I have at the moment. Uh, I mean, my blog isn't the right vehicle for this forever, but at least it can get, get the ball rolling. Um, and it, if you know, if somebody wants to write to to start a site that is open source and community run is, and is dedicated to uh, advertising uh, projects who need money. I'm totally in favor of that. All right, another uh, question. Something for everyone to be generally aware of in this is we currently have Patreon and Subscribestar. We've already seen Patreon kind of screw things up when they demonstrate that they will ban people for political reasons. 
So some diversity of platform does need to be enforced, or not enforced, but it needs, needs to be sought. Out. Uh, and by the way, um, it's possible to set up recurring payments through PayPal. Um, what Patreon brings to the table isn't recurring payments. PayPal can do that. Uh, what PayPal um, brings to the table is people who are being supported get a dedicated channel to, to communicate with their patrons and tell them about what they're doing. So we actually do have some platform diversity. Uh, for those of us in the room who don't know it, uh, what is the URL to your blog? Uh, if you just Google for ESR Armed and Dangerous, you'll find it. Additional questions from the crowd. Any, any additional questions? I guess um, if we're wrapping up now, I want to emphasize that it's not enough for the people in this room to, to all sign up and start shipping $30 a month. <coughs> we... <coughs> No, I'm not dying. Um, we have to see that this this custom spreads across our whole culture because, um, well, the problem is at that scale. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, I would like to thank you for putting up with all the remote uh, shenanigans, and I'm very happy that when Chrome froze, it didn't freeze you into a really awkward face. You actually look quite presentable as Chrome has frozen. Jeez. <laughs> okay. Thank you, random gods of technology. Uh, okay, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much for being willing to play ball with us on Remote Talks. Uh, yes, yeah, so I know you don't like them, and uh, I see your position is uh, not one without merit. It is very much, very much <laughs> well earned. You, you didn't know it was like this? Well, Murphy does have a close relationship with the conference, but this was pretty impressive even for us. Let me tell you, for, vi for video conferencing, this is about typical. I've never seen it get much better than this. Well, if there are no further questions, then I'll kick it to speakerphone, and hopefully we'll get a round of applause loud enough to bleed over even into my phone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Goodbye.